Greetings, everyone. Welcome to Practical Talks for Family Docs, the College of Family Physicians of Canada's live clinical webinar series. Today's webinar is entitled, Approaches to Deprescribing for Older People, What to Stop, When, and How. My name is Alan Grill, and I'm a family physician working in Markham, Ontario, and a part-time physician advisor with the College of Family Physicians of Canada in the Department of Programs and Practice Support. It's my pleasure to be your host. I'd like to start by reading the statement of acknowledgement of traditional land. We acknowledge that the lands on which we are hosting this meeting include the traditional territories of many nations. The CFPC recognizes that the many injustices experienced by the indigenous peoples of what we now call Canada continue to affect their health and well-being. The CFPC respects that indigenous people have rich cultural and traditional practices that have been known to improve health outcomes. I invite all attendees to reflect on the territories you are calling in from as we commit ourselves to gaining knowledge, forging a new, culturally safe relationship, and contributing to reconciliation. It's now my pleasure to introduce today's webinar speaker joining us today. Dr. Barbara Farrell is a pharmacist in the Briere Geriatric Day Hospital and leads the Deep Prescribing Guidelines Research Team at the Briere Research Institute in Ottawa, Ontario. Dr. Fail completed her Bachelor and Doctor of Pharmacy degrees at the University of Toronto and her residency at Shaduk McMaster in Hamilton. She is a scientist with the Briere Research Institute, an assistant professor with the Department of Family Medicine at the University of Ottawa, and an adjunct assistant professor with the School of Pharmacy at the University of Waterloo. In 2011, she received the Canadian Pharmacist of the Year Award from the Canadian Pharmacists Association. And in 2019, the CIHR Betty Havens Award for Knowledge Translation in Aging. Dr. Farrell is a founding member of the Canadian Deprescribing Network and a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee of the American Deprescribing Research Network. And on a personal note, I also sit as a CFPC rep on the CADEN or the Canadian Deprescribing Network Healthcare Provider Committee that is chaired by Dr. Farrell. So good morning or good afternoon. <laughs> uh, just a little bit of housekeeping before we uh, we hand it over to Dr. Farrell. So for everybody watching on YouTube, uh, please submit your questions in the chat window by logging into your own Google Google or YouTube account. We will have a 15 minute Q and A session to close out the webinar. If you can't see the chat window, you may be in the full screen mode. Send along your questions and we'll address them at the end of the webinar. 
In terms of main pro credits, if you're watching this as a live webcast, it is eligible for one main pro plus credit. In order to claim your credit, you will need to complete a short registration form or survey. The link will be posted in the chat or the comments window at the end of the webinar. And we ask you to complete this by the end of the day, Friday of this week. And without further ado, I will hand things over to Dr. Farrell. Hi. Hi. Thank you Thank very, you very much, much for the introduction. introduction. Just going to turn my speaker down a little bit. I am very pleased to uh, be here this afternoon to talk to you about deprescribing. It's a topic I feel really passionate about. And I, um, I'm going to try to make this particular presentation very practical. I um, Essentially, I'm going to try to present the 20 years of cumulative experience working in the geriatric day hospital at Breer. And so I want to recognize all of the physicians and, and other staff that I work with uh, in the day hospital um, for all of their contributions over the years uh, to, to the knowledge that we are creating and trying to mobilize around uh, deprescribing. So I will start with my disclosures. Uh, I do have some honoraria, travel expenses, et cetera, but they are all with uh, nonprofit organizations. And this particular presentation does not have any financial support. So um, what I'm gonna do this afternoon is talk about some cases, uh, patients, um, patient scenarios that are common in the day hospital and how we manage them with, with the prescribing um, processes. I want to make it very practical. And so I've uh, included a, a lot of different resources. You'll see a lot of charts and tools and, and websites that you can refer to afterwards. And I'll start first with a, a patient. So uh, this was a lady uh, who came to the day hospital close to 10 years ago now. Uh, she was a 77 year old woman who had a number of different uh, conditions. Uh, she was actually taking 27 medications. Uh, she was wheelchair bound, quite sedated, very hard to interview. Uh, she kept sort of falling out of the wheelchair every time we tried to um, help her transfer. And she really had been referred to long-term care and was completely dependent on others for her care. So when we looked at her medications, we, we realized that there were a lot of her medications could be contributing to issues with the falls that she was having, um, with the confusion uh, that, that she was experiencing. In fact, she'd been diagnosed with uh, dementia and had galantamine started. She also had a, a problem with constipation and was on multiple laxatives. So you can see in this diagram that we really tried to sort out which medications might be contributing to the different problems that she was having. And we published this in CMAJ in 2013. And I bring it up because th this case report and the seven others like it that we published at the same time all come with interactive discussion guides that can be used uh, in an interprofessional way. They can be used with students. Uh, they lead you through the case uh, and, and get people talking about what medications might be contributing to problems. And so, uh, they're published, there's several in Canadian Family Physician, uh, a few in CMAJ and some in uh, the Canadian Pharmacist Journal. And we have links to all of those um, on our website at deprescribing.org. So you can see with 27 medications that this lady um, really qualified for, for the definition of polypharmacy. And at the time, sort of 10 years ago, we were talking about polypharmacy being more than five medications. And I, I do like to still use that number five as a, uh, kind of a, a red flag that uh, we need to look to make sure that there isn't risk of harm uh, that, that's occurring with multiple medications. But more recently, the, the definition has moved away from number of medications into the use of more medications that are needed or for which harm outweighs benefit. And um, this increases the risk of drug interactions, side effects, falls, fractures, functional and cognitive decline. Non-adherence is something we don't often think about. And if you just think about the mental effort of trying to manage, for example, 27 medications during a day, uh, you, you can realize that when people are overburdened, they, they stop taking their medications. In particular, they neglect those medications that we would consider to be critically important. And Hanlon published about um, 10 years ago, um, uh, 
a study that showed that if you're taking one medication, you're usually about 80% compliant, but when you get to more than four medications, the compliance drops to about 50%. So that's important to think about every time you're adding a new medication uh, for somebody. So as we sort of moved away from this idea of, of polypharmacy, referring to numbers of medications where, you know, it could be perfectly fine if someone's on more than five medications if they've got multiple chronic conditions. We've kind of moved to new terminology now. And in the United States, they recently published this report on medication overload, uh, which is sort of the, the newest um, phrase that's used. And I would highly recommend this report for people who want to understand more about polypharmacy and the risks of polypharmacy and why it's a significant health problem. What I'd like to do now is move on to um, some common um, problems in the day hospital. When Alan first invited me to um, give this presentation, he asked me to talk about the things that drove us crazy in the day hospital and, uh, and how we could sort of try to prevent these things from happening. So in consultation with the physicians that I work with, we came up with these um, five common problems anticholinergic burden and uh, CNS depressant medications being used by people referred because of cognitive impairment falls in function, such as the patient I presented a few minutes ago. Signs and symptoms not being recognized as being caused by a drug resulting in um, tests, referrals, and uh, prescribing cascades where medications are started to treat the side effect of another medication. Drugs being continued when the reason and effectiveness are unclear. Uh, doses that are continued at the same high doses that were tolerated at a younger age, but are problematic in frailty or advanced age. And finally, aggressive treatment to reach um, targets that ultimately lead to um, people having falls. And so what I want to do in, in the rest of the workshop is try to address each of these with examples. So if we look at drugs that cause cognitive impairment, you can see that there are a lot of them, um, anticholinergics, CNS depressants, cardiovascular medications, NSAIDs, uh, steroids. And I wanna point out that in that anticholinergic um, box, um, we, we also include trazodone. And I think that's important to mention just because I'm often seeing that patients are having their benzodiazepine stopped, but having trazodone started uh, instead. And that likely is going to have a similar impact on cognitive impairment uh, that a, a different sedative would have. So many medications that cause cognitive impairment also cause falls. And uh, here we've got, again, anticholinergics, CNS depressants, antidepressants, antihypertensives and antihyperglycemics that are either dropping blood pressure or dropping blood sugar, uh, certain cardiac medications. And again, in the antidepressant, anticholinergic section, I'm including uh, trazodone, which is a really messy drug pharmacologically. It um, has some serotonin antagonist um, effect. It's a weak histamine uh, antagonist. It is anticholinergic. It, it, uh, antagonizes alpha receptors, so it can cause orthostatic hypotension. So just to be aware to use caution uh, with that drug. And so in terms of some examples from the day hospital, in this first one, this is a patient referred recently who'd been taking imipramine 300 milligrams at bedtime for about 50 years. And they'd recently been started on Dinepazil uh, and had their imipramine reduced to 250 milligrams prior to admission. And um, as a tricyclic antidepressant, imipramine is highly anticholinergic. That's a super high dose that the patient's taking. The denepazil is essentially going to oppose the effect of the imipramine. Uh, and so we may, it's possible here we're looking at a prescribing cascade where the imipramine was causing the cognitive impairment and then we're started on a drug to treat that. Uh, the second case, Another case of cognitive impairment, in this particular situation, the patient had actually been to three different memory disorder clinics uh, in different cities, where she was told that each one, um, that the dementia was likely medication induced. She was started at one of the uh, clinics on galantamine. Her pergabalin 300 milligrams TID was continued. And uh, this lady was a bit challenging to get to the day hospital because she needed to be accompanied everywhere. The third case uh, illustrates a number of anticholinergic and CNS depressant effects related to these particular medications that the patient was taking, uh, trazodone, citalopram, mirtazapine, quetiapine, pergabalin, 
um, caffeine, furosemide, empagliflozin. Uh, and so this was a bit of a challenging one, as I'll illustrate as we talk a little bit further in terms of which medication do you reduce or stop first. In that first case, uh, with the amipramine, we continued the amipramine reduction, and I'll explain a bit how we did that. In the second case, we started a pregabalin reduction. We actually got down to 50 milligrams BID before uh, this lady's trigeminal neuralgia started to return. So uh, we were able to get her to a much lower dose, which had an interesting impact in that she didn't need to be accompanied anymore by the time she was uh, finished at the day hospital. So that was um, sort of a very interesting um, output. And we, we sent her back for a reassessment of whether the galantamine was still needed. So um, th that first question that I always ask when it comes to cognitive imp impairment and falls is, can this be caused by a drug? To me, that's part of the differential diagnosis. And it can be a challenge to figure out if indeed drugs are contributing uh, to a problem. So what I've done here is listed a number of resources that you can use to figure out if medications are contributing. Uh, the first one is an anticholinergic burden calculator that's online. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. You can also look in the monographs on RXTX. Uh, which I believe all physicians who are members of CMA have free access to. You can ask a pharmacist, um, except for yesterday for about an hour, you could um, Google uh, drugs that cause the side effect or drug induced. The, the two main sources that come up when I do that are Medline Plus and Mayo Clinic, and they have a lot of really uh, well-referenced information on drugs that cause diarrhea, drugs that cause headache, drugs that cause appetite suppression, etc. Rx Files has some great information, particularly on anticholinergic medications, and I'll show you their chart in a minute. Uh, and then we also have consultation services like Jerry Medrisk and eConsult that are available in Ontario, uh, where people can um, ha have a pharmacist, a pharmacologist, a geriatric psychiatrist, et cetera, look at a list of medications and, and help you figure out um, what medications might be contributing. And then lastly, if you're super nerdy like me, you actually have a copy of uh, Tisdale's book on drug-induced diseases. So anticholinergic burden. Uh, there's been a, a lot of research in this area in the last number of years, and there are several scales available. This is one from Aging Brain Care uh, that illustrates sort of the different amount of anticholinergic activity that drugs have. So in the first column, you see drugs that have a low score, score of one, where there's some in vitro um, if antagonistic effect on muscarinic receptors. Drugs that have a score of two are those medications where it, uh, anticholinergic activity is mentioned in the monograph or in the literature or through expert opinion. And those that have a score of three tend to be those that have been associated with uh, delirium. The back of this chart, which you can easily find online, also contains the uh, references uh, and they tend to keep this updated as well. So this information was used to inform the anticholinergic burden uh, calculator that I was talking about a few minutes ago. And what I've done is taken the, um, the drugs uh, that one of the case presentations earlier uh, were mentioned, uh, trazodone, citalopram, quetiapine, furosemide, and amipramine, shows you the score, adds up the score. So here we have a seven. And then the literature tells us that anyone who scores more than a three is at high risk of confusion, falls, and, uh, and death. So uh, this then leads to a series of charts that give you information on safer alternatives that have less anticholinergic burden for the different um, medications. And so I've, I find it's very, a very helpful tool um, to determine burden but also to find uh, alternatives. So in the next slide, here we've got the anticholinergic uh, reference list from RX files that shows you medications in blue that have lower anticholinergic risk and the medications in red have higher anticholinergic risk. So this is just another example of an anticholinergic burden tool that you can use. And then uh, the section in RX files goes on to give you um, 
the different anticholinergic effects that you see in a mild, moderate, and severe way, how to deal with those side effects, and then has information on, um, on how to manage um, the reduction of anticholinergics. So what about other side effects? There's, um, you know, we, we have lots of patients with incontinence, constipation, diarrhea, tremor, et cetera. So I've, I've just included these as examples along with the, uh, the relevant references. And this chart comes from an article that Debbie Kwan and I published uh, several years ago that's available online. Uh, if people want to have the full article, I'm going to reference several of the charts in it. So I would highly recommend pulling that article if you're interested in reading more information. And I'll just draw your attention to the tremor and the relationship to SSRIs uh, down in the bottom row, because I want to talk for a minute about serotonin syndrome. So here we have uh, an awesome tool from the University of Waterloo School of Pharmacy. Uh, about uh, serotonin syndrome that shows you uh, the mild effects. So we tend to think of serotonin syndrome as only being um, recognizable in its severe form, but it's important to recognize it in a mild form. And often this is what we see in our patients in the day hospital, some anxiety, nervousness, insomnia, nausea, tremor, all of these can be um, indicators that the patient has mild serotonin syndrome. So it's important to look at, for example, their SSRI doses and to look at other medications that might be contributing as well. For example, um, other antidepressants, uh, opioids, cough, cold medications, including over the counter dextromethorphan, different natural health products, et cetera. And so, Combine, looking at all of those in the same way that we think about anticholinergic burden, but thinking about that serotonergic burden and how that might be contributing to problems that the patient has. So there's an example here uh, on the right-hand side of a, a recent patient who uh, had a tremor develop after their sertraline started, um, was diagnosed with restless leg syndrome, started on Premipexol, but then we found as we were able to reduce the sertraline that in fact the tremor went away and we were able to stop the premipexol. A couple of other examples here, pedal edema. Uh, this is one we commonly see where people taking a calcium channel blocker and a gabapentinoid develop pedal edema, subsequently get started on, um, on furosemide. Uh, and for this particular lady, she had a lot of difficulty getting her shoes on because of the pedal edema. So she was wearing slippers, but she was also falling because she had developed some orthostatic hypertension related to the furosemide. So in this case, we tried reducing the doses of the gabapentin and amlodipine, um, actually stopped the amlodipine because we, we modified her blood pressure target. Then we were able to stop the furosemide and she stopped falling and her swelling uh, resolved. In the second case, uh, the diarrhea case, again, this is a common problem we see in the day hospital. And this particular patient didn't wanna leave the house. Um, the wife told me that he, they actually travel with plastic bags and extra pants for him because of the problem. He was taking loperamide frequently and we identified of his medications, there were four that could be contributing to diarrhea. And so by reducing his Orbeprazole to daily, by reducing his atorvastatin dose, by reducing his metformin dose and reducing his citalopram, we were actually able to resolve the diarrhea. And these are all examples of prescribing cascades. And there are, are, are many that, um, that exist. This again is another table from the article that Debbie and I published that gives you some examples of different prescribing cascades that you might see um, in practice. And this is, I think, a useful diagram uh, to show students the different areas of, of the body and different symptom um, symptoms that can be contributed to by medications. For example, what medications might contribute to uh, depression or constipation or urinary symptoms or gout or diabetes or different arrhythmias or hypertension or heart failure. So uh, I would recommend this particular article as well. So I think that I've probably got the message across that the first thing that I ask uh, when a patient uh, presents with any kind of sign or symptom, whether it be um, falls or cognitive impairment or diarrhea or tremor, et cetera, is that my first question is, can this be caused by a drug? 
And there's lots of information, as I think I've, I've demonstrated, available to, to inform us about the side effects of drugs and whether doses are too high or there are drug interactions. The harder part for me is that second piece. Um, do the original signs and symptoms for which that drug is being used still require uh, treatment with this drug? So for example, in that patient who had the tremor and we were reducing the sertraline, we weren't 100% sure whether or not uh, depression still needed to be treated uh, with the sertraline or not. And, and I think everybody can identify with the fact that it's, it's often hard to know when a patient's been on a drug for a very long period of time, prescribed by somebody else, whether or not the patient is still benefiting um, from the medication. So in terms of whether the dose can be lowered um, or whether we actually start the, the process of deprescribing, it really, really depends on whether or not we feel there's, uh, there's some effectiveness of the medication uh, there. So the next uh, question, uh, once we have determined, you know, that a sign or symptom might be caused by a drug and we've started the tapering process of that drug, is do we still need the second drug treating the side effect of the first? So is there a second drug? Yes. Can that drug be stopped? If yes, then we begin the deprescribing process. And, uh, and the examples that I gave earlier around the, um, the amipramine uh, being used, and as we reduce the dose of the amipramine, will we be able to stop the dinepazil? That's an example of, of how to approach this question. So sounds easy so far, but what if there's more than one potentially causative drug? So in that diarrhea case where we had the statin, the PPI, the metformin, and the citalopram that might be contributing, can we reduce them all at the same time or do we need to prioritize which one to reduce first? And you really have to weigh the benefit and risk and the patient preference in this case. Uh, sometimes it's easier with patients in the day hospital to start with one medication that they're less attached to or that we think might be more problematic. Other times uh, we would be able to uh, reduce the doses of several at once depending on how they felt about it. And in this case where those four drugs affect different systems, it was relatively easy to do those dose reductions concurrently. In the other case I presented where the patient was taking trazodone, citalopram, mirtazapine, and quetiapine, we'd be more likely to reduce those one at a time, but we might concurrently reduce uh, the pergabalin, furosemide, or epiglifosin that they were taking. So a lot there about how to resolve prescribing cascades if we see them. I think it's important to talk about how to prevent them, and I think the the best way to prevent prescribing cascades is to start at low doses and increase the doses slowly <clears throat> where possible, choose agents that have fewer side effects. And the third one is probably the most important. Always ask, can this be caused by a drug? Anytime a new sign or symptom uh, emerges. Asking patients if they have new symptoms, particularly if medication has been recently started or the dose changed providing patients with information about what to monitor for. For example, we're, we're seeing that calcium channel blocker, um, ankle edema side effect seems to be quite common. So just saying to people, if you develop this, let me know. I, you don't have to give them the entire list of all the side effects, uh, but for those common ones, I think that's helpful. And then consider the risk benefit of additional side effects from adding a second medication. Uh, and maybe first think about reducing the first medication to see if you can get the side effect to, uh, to go away. So how about, um, how do you tell if doses are too high? Uh, and this is challenging in geriatrics because there's very little information on pharmacokinetic changes with age and frailty. Um, there's no Health Canada requirement for uh, doing such studies. There's a lot of individual variation. And so what I've done in this table, and again, this is from um, the polypharmacy article that Debbie and I published, I've tried to provide some examples here, including the mechanisms. We tend to think only of the kidney uh, function changing as people get older, and we forget about the fact that liver function likely changes as well as we have reduced liver mass and blood flow that affect people's ability to metabolize uh, medication. And this is not just metabolizing medication to eliminate it from the body, but it's also thinking about 
how that affects absorption. So drugs that normally go through a very high, what we call a high first pass metabolism because they're extensively metabolized in the liver. If, if you've got reduction in that liver metabolism, then what happens is you've increased the bioavailability of those drugs because they're no longer getting metabolized before they hit the, uh, the general bloodstream. And the, the class that I wanna point out there, the classic class that we're, we don't think about are beta blockers. And so we often see patients who are on high doses of beta blockers and, and they're very tiny and frail uh, and they are very fatigued, they're depressed, their blood pressure is low, they have orthostatic hypotension. And we, so we find actually reducing and, and in many cases stopping beta blockers to be um, very helpful. So just rethinking um, the dosing of medications is helpful. And I've tried to summarize here those that we want to pay particular attention to. And you can see beta blockers are at the top of my list. So the big frustration, I think I alluded to this earlier, is that the effectiveness of medications is often unclear. And this is a list that um, the physicians and I in the day hospital put together in the last few weeks about uh, the medications where we're never really certain if they're helping, the patients are uncertain, and quite often the family physicians are uncertain as well. So uh, gabapentin, pregabalin, is it helping or not? Uh, does a patient still need an antidepressant 50 years later? Um, is something like duloxetine being used for depression or pain? Uh, many people can't tell us if their pain medication works at all. Uh, we don't really know in a lot of cases why they're taking a PPI or if it's still needed. Uh, we don't know if drugs for urinary symptoms are actually helping uh, the patient. The reasons for furosemide are often unclear, so we don't know if people are taking it because they have ankle edema from another medication or because they actually have heart failure. Uh, we often don't know why people are taking aspirin, and, and with beta blockers, there's an assumption that it's being used for blood pressure, but they could be using it for tremor, for migraine, prophylaxis, uh, for several other atrial fibrillation, other indications. Uh, so just sorting out what the medication is being used for and how well it's working uh, can be a bit of an investigative uh, process. Before I go on to talk about deprescribing, I wanna mention the importance of adjusting targets as people age, in particular, uh, blood pressure targets. Um, and I've, I've put a tiny excerpt of, a, uh, excerpt of an article we published in Canadian Family Physicians several years about how we adjust blood pressure targets in the very old. Uh, so I've highlighted the key trials, Hyvet and Shep, uh, in the in the 80 plus age range, and the information there about appropriate targets. And I just want to point out that these are these targets are from healthy individuals that participated in these trials. Um, there's very little available on people, elderly people who have established cardiovascular disease, in terms of what would be the appropriate blood pressure target to minimize um, risk associated with hypotension. And similarly with blood sugar, here I have um, referenced the antihyperglycemic guideline that we published in Canadian Family Physician a few years ago in terms of aiming for an appropriate A1C uh, as people age and become frail. A uh, higher blood glucose target is likely fine, and the importance of avoiding, of avoiding agents that are likely to cause um, hypoglycemia. And before I leave this slide, I want to talk also about uh, adjusting um, prevention targets. So, in the day hospital, we're often looking at what are the what are the appropriate goals of care for this patient as they're aging, and that's shift from prevention and risk reduction to quality of life and symptom management, and that often affects which medications we choose to keep or deprescribe. So deprescribing is defined as a planned and supervised process of dose reduction or elimination of medication that might be causing harm or no longer be providing benefit. And it's really just part of good prescribing, backing off when doses are too high or stopping medications that are no longer needed or might be causing harm. These are the steps that I follow uh, when we're deprescribing, looking at the whole of the patient's medication experience, identifying those meds that are potentially inappropriate or might have less evidence or benefit, 
or may have some harm, assessing each of them for eligibility, prioritizing for deprescribing, and then planning a tapering and monitoring protocol. Those steps three and four are pretty hard, <laughs> actually, and they depend on balancing the continued benefit of a medication against the potential risk. And this scale shifts over time as people get older and they acquire co more comorbidities and medications and they become frail. So the potential benefits of continuing a medication or to improve a sign or symptom, reduce the risk of future illness, slow the progression of disease, the potential harms are, as I've mentioned, adverse drug reactions, drug interactions, uh, they can worsen frailty and functional impairment, non-adherence, et cetera. The benefits and harms of deprescribing, the potential benefits are reducing numbers of medications, adverse drug reactions. Some studies have shown reductions in mortality. You can reduce drug and healthcare costs. You can improve adherence. It's generally safe, but you need to anticipate and monitor and manage adverse drug foot adverse drug withdrawal events. So there's a number of strategies that we use with our patients for deprescribing, the first of which is to engage uh, with patients and provide a clear rationale, which some of the literature is demonstrating, um, even as recently as the last few weeks, the importance of um, outlining the potential side effects that may be occurring as a result of the medication using deprescribing guidelines to help decide when it's appropriate to deprescribe and how to do it safely, and then developing and communicating a plan with patients. So this first bit about engaging people in deprescribing, about six years ago, we actually hired a marketing firm to help us come up with some of these phrases. And uh, I, I think they're quite helpful. Uh, I use them in practice all the time. Uh, you know, people handle and respond to drugs differently as they get older. People become more sensitive to side effects as they get older. It's normal to reduce doses as people get older. Medications that were appropriate then may not be as useful now. Sometimes the risks of a drug outweigh the benefit. And instead of treating a drug side effect with another drug, the better option is to see if we can reduce or stop the first one. These are all really effective phrases to use. In terms of deprescribing guidelines, our team has published five guidelines, um, four in Canadian Family Physician and one on an Australian uh, dementia website. You can find all of this information on our website, deprescribing.org, and I'll just show you briefly how a couple of these algorithms are organized. So early on, uh, one of my family physician colleagues told me no one would ever read our 7,000 word guidelines and we need to have like a, a one page algorithm with the decision making steps. So if we look here, let's say for that patient who was on the Rebeprazole 20 milligrams BID, why is the patient taking it? We were able to rule out that they did not have Barrett's, uh, they weren't taking an NSAID, they didn't have severe esophagitis, there was no history of a bleeding ulcer. They likely fell into this box, mild to moderate esophagitis. They'd been treated um, for many years at the same dose. Uh, so the recommendation is to start deprescribing which in this case, the first step would be decreased to a lower dose, which we did, changing her to once daily. And then the um, equally uh, strong recommendation is to stop the PPI and use it on demand when the patient needs it for heartburn if it returns. We've included monitoring plans in these algorithms, as well as management approaches for occasional symptoms, what to do if symptoms relapse. And on the back of the algorithm, you'll see which medications in that class are available in Canada, some hints around uh, engaging patients, lists of side effects, because as I mentioned, um, engaging patients typically involves informing them about potential side effects, any recommendations that we could pull from the deep prescribing studies and the liter literature about how best to taper medications. And then we, we've got a definition here for on-demand uh, medication use. So similar algorithm for benzodiazepines, I won't go through these in detail, but just to show you how they are set up and one for antihyperglycemics similarly. So just um, what I wanna do now is just show you a few other um, opportunities or options for getting information on how to deprescribe. First of all is within RX files. Uh, there's actually a whole chapter in the Jerry RX files around tapering medications in older adults. It gives a lot of helpful information. 
There's a website uh, from New South Wales Therapeutic Advisory Group, which has a section on deprescribing guides and consumer information pamphlets, similar to some of the stuff that we've produced. This particular um, table is from an Australian researcher who's uh, summarized all of the information on how to taper medications that have anticholinergic burden. So if we look down at the bottom to tricyclic antidepressants as an example, uh, and we think about our mipramine uh, patient, the recommendations vary according to how quickly to taper. Uh, anywhere from reducing the dose by 25% every day to 50% every week. Now with that lady, we actually reduced her mipramine dose by about 10% every week or two uh, because it does come in 25 milligram tablets. So we were able to reduce uh, very slowly. And that seemed to uh, be effective for her. This next chart is from the article that Debbie and I published on polypharmacy, and it gives um, a good uh, summary of what to monitor as you are deprescribing different classes of medication. So for example, what to monitor if you're deprescribing beta blockers in terms of heart rate, blood pressure, angina, anxiety. MedStopper uh, website also has uh, recommendations around how quickly to deprescribe and what to monitor. And so here again, I put in amipramine and gabapentin uh, for the patients I mentioned earlier that were taking those medications. And you can see there's a suggested taper approach and symptoms to monitor. So for gabapentin, for example, we're not looking at um, any withdrawal reactions, but we're looking for a possible return of symptoms such as pain. RXTX uh, has within its monographs sections on how to withdraw medications and whether there is a withdrawal sy syndrome. So for example, here you can see the SSRI uh, withdrawal syndrome, a good description, which medications it's more problematic with, uh, which medications can be stopped quickly um, and which need to be reduced more slowly. And as I mentioned earlier, um, physicians who are members of CMA all have access to that information through the free app. So I've talked so far about anticholinergic drugs, antidepressant drugs, um, pain medications. Uh, something that's a little bit more challenging are making decisions about reducing and stopping cardiovascular medications. So what I've done here is just summarize four of the recent studies that are available on this topic. And you can see they were all published in 2019, 2020. So this is a really new area. Uh, I would, if you're on Twitter, follow Parag Goel, who is a cardiologist in the US. He's actually one of the junior investigators with the US Deprescribing Research Network. And he's very interested in looking at deprescribing of cardiovascular medications. So these particular um, articles are, are all um, helpful if those are the kinds of, of decisions you're making uh, for your patients. So now I would just like to highlight a few additional um, resources to help with um, managing medication overload. The first uh, is in, on a programmatic scale. The Institute for Healthcare uh, Improvement in the US has published two excellent resources on their deprescribing experience within their hospitals and healthcare systems, uh, including a number of different recommendations as to um, how to go about that safely in, in a larger health system perspective. There are a number of ongoing uh, research trials in Canada. I've highlighted a few of them here, MedSafer, Spider, Taper MD, and Safer Meds Newfoundland. Uh, the latter is one in which pharmacists in Newfoundland are providing a pharmaceutical opinion to uh, prescribers around the deprescribing of PPIs and benzodiazepines using the guidelines that we produced here at Briere. Green Shield is doing something similar uh, in providing coaching supports for pharmacists that are working with patients to help to reduce um, benzodiazepines and uh, PPIs. And lastly, I'll just summarize some different ideas for your toolbox. Uh, these are the types of resources available on our website, deprescribing.org. Uh, you can see the 
there are the guidelines, pamphlets uh, for patients. We've created whiteboard videos for each of those algorithms that goes through a couple of different examples of how to apply them. Uh, and so we've also got some testimonials, webinar recordings. So for example, if you want a whole hour on shared decision-making and deprescribing, there's a webinar for that. There's also a link to our smartphone app. And we highly encourage people to follow us on Twitter uh, and on Facebook. The website itself has had a lot of uptake. We've had over 150,000 downloads from the website. Uh, the videos uh, have been watched more than 36,000 times. We've had more than 5,000 uh, downloads of the app. Um, and then in Twitter, I think we're up to about um, 10,400 um, followers right now. And that's a really active um, space where people are posting almost daily uh, about something about deep prescribing. Encourage people to also look at the Canadian Deprescribing Network website where you can find a lot of patient information. There is also a polypharmacy and deprescribing module that's free that's on our Briere website. It takes about 20 minutes. It's great for students and demonstrates how a person could develop polypharmacy over time. And I know earlier I mentioned uh, jury med risk and e-consult, um, but I just wanted to point those out again for people in Ontario. If you don't have access to a day hospital, you don't have the time that's needed to go through that 27 medication uh, list, um, you don't have a geriatrician or a pharmacist that can help with that, I uh, think I would consider these consultant services. And coming back to the Lowen report that I mentioned early on, they've now developed a national action plan that has five recommendations that they're trying to implement nationally to try to reduce uh, the impact of polypharmacy. And lastly, I'll just come back to that patient that I talked about. We actually reduced her medications from 27 to 17, improved her, um, her balance. Uh, she started walking with a cane. She stopped having falls. Uh, her cognition improved, her constipation resolved, uh, her sleeping improved, uh, her pain didn't get any worse. And when she came to us a year later uh, to sign the consent form for publication in CMAJ, she was quite happy to report that um, her glantamine had been stopped because uh, her physicians had told her she no longer had uh, dementia. And so the key takeaways for today um, for you, I think, are to ask if a sign or symptom can be caused by a drug to make that part of the differential diagnosis. If yes, then do you still need that causative drug? Can it be reduced or stopped? Adjust uh, targets with advancing age or frailty. Think about lowering doses as people get older. Engage patients. Make sure you monitor while you deprescribe and use the many resources that are available to you. And I believe that this presentation will be open access afterwards. And so people will be able to watch it and, and get access to the different um, tools that I have suggested. And now I would be happy to entertain any questions, Alan. Well, uh, Dr. Farrell, that was a fantastic talk. Thank you so much. So just to let the audience know, um, we're going to collect all the websites you mentioned and make sure they get put on our website with the link to this recorded talk. So that's awesome. And, uh, you know, just from a personal note, I just really want to thank you uh, for just highlighting some of the challenges with regards to elderly patients. You know, a lot of family physicians obviously see elderly patients and some of us have a specific interest in it. And so this really is close to my heart and in, in all the things I've learned over the years in terms of what to be careful about. And I'm really, I'm so thrilled you shared some of your knowledge with our audience. And, and I know you could go on and on, but we do have some questions um, and I'm gonna ask them. Uh, this is from our audience and some of these are clinical questions. So just answer as, as, as obviously best you can based on your experience. So one of our members, Sally asked, um, if a patient has a history of a, of a GI bleed and is on one of the new anti-coagulants, anti, uh, one of the DOACs, should they continue a proton pump inhibitor long term? This is a common question we get. I'm just wondering if you could shed some light on that. So I, I think in terms of our PPI deprescribing guideline, a patient like that would, would fit into a sort of the exclusion box in that um, a history, a documented history of a GI bleed uh, would be an indication for continuing on a PPI, regardless of whether they're taking a DOAC or not. Um, there's a lot of, there are a lot of medications aside from DOACs that that increase bleeding risk SSRIs, for example. And we, we tried to address that in our guideline in terms of 
those patients needing to be individually assessed. And so our our recommendation is, you know, as a situation like that needs a, a more consultation with a gastroenterologist and with the patient themselves in terms of, of risk benefit. But my, my sense for a patient like that is that we would probably continue the PPI. Okay, yeah, that's great. Um, there's another question here that uh, probably doesn't just apply to these drugs, but so I'll ask you to comment in general, but with this one example. So one of our members, Richard, asked, you know, if, if you have a patient in living in a long-term care facility that might have a life expectancy of, let's say, two years or less, is there any point in continuing their bisphosphonate or mm -hmm. something like Prolia for prevention of osteoporotic-related fractures? That's a great question, and I'm not sure I know the answer to that off the top of my head. Um, again, there have there've been some withdrawal studies uh, to stop bisphosphonates, but I think those have demonstrated um, sort of no change in, in fracture risk, only in patients who are not at high risk uh, anyway. I'm not sure what's being done in long-term care because of course then we, you know, the question is, you know, are they more at risk um, or are they less at risk of falls? Uh, and how is the bisphosphonate efficacy affected by um, bed rest, for example? So uh, it, it's a good question. I don't have the answer off the top of my head for that one. No problem. I do know that there, there has been some work done. I know Dr. Sid Feldman's one of the, um, he's one of the chairs of uh, one of our member interest groups. And I think there, there might've been some, some guidance documents posted about that. So we'll find those and we'll, we'll send it with our link Great. For, for those who asked that question. There was another question here from, um, from uh, one of our members that said, you know, you provided a lot of websites today and, and we will be sharing those with, yeah. with the member. But the question is, are there two or three favorite sites you have? And, and in particular, when you answer that question, can you answer it with the lens of, if we're dealing with busy, let's say community-based family physicians who want to make sure they're prescribing safely and they want to pick up a potential polypharmacy issue here, uh, what would be two or three sites that you think should be their go-to in terms of first choice? I think it probably depends on what their question is. So if their question is, can this be caused by a drug? then the, the Mayo Clinic and Medline Plus sites are helpful for that uh, because you can just Google, can this be, can, you know, drug-induced diarrhea, for example. If you're trying to figure out um, how quickly you can reduce a dose, what you need to monitor, uh, then probably RXTX uh, in the monographs uh, for the different drugs and the and RX files uh, now has information about that. Those, those would be my, my top ones there. Perfect. There's another question about acetylcholinesterase inhibitors with regards to dementia, but the question is more about if you've made the decision that you think the patient might benefit from the drug, what are some of the side effects that are really important to discuss with either the patient, depending on their level of cognitive impairment or their substitute decision maker, before you actually prescribe? Or, or are there certain side effects you tell them that we need to look out for if you are going to start the actual drug? Right, right. So I don't do a lot of prescribing of acetylcholinesterase inhibitors myself. I, we, we doesn't seem to be something that we're starting in the day hospital a lot of the time. Usually we're actually trying to reduce the drugs that cause cognitive impairment. Um, but what I have seen is that typically, you know, we start at low doses, especially in our frail elderly, and we monitor for um, GI effects um, primarily. I'd, I'd have to consult, I think, with someone from a memory disorder clinic to, to comment on whether they do any cardiovascular testing um, before at baseline or, or afterwards um, and what else they might commonly monitor for. Okay, no problem. Um, there's another question here about EMR fatigue. So, you know, those of us, and I know it, I know it varies across Canada, but there are many family doctors that use some sort of electronic medical record in their office. And often when they're doing electronic prescriptions or their prescription writer, they will get a warning that comes up. But one of the complaints we often get from members is that there's too many warnings. You almost get like a warning fatigue. Um, 
Is there any advice you can give in terms of either how we deal with that or if we if we could improve the system, how it could be done better so that people aren't as um, aren't as frustrated with sort of all the alerts or they're going to pay attention right. to more? Right. Do those alerts come with a level of importance? I think it depends on the EMR. Sometimes, oh, yes. Okay. Because I, when I check for drug interactions, I use Lexicom. Um, so, I, you know, I would take those 27 medications, put them all in Lexicom, and it'll tell me the 54 drug interactions from those 27 medications. But it categorizes them into where there are contraindications. Uh, and then where there are cautions and where there are just, you know, just you should monitor this. So I would tend to pay more attention to ones where medications are contraindicated um, or where there is a, a, a high level of, of warning with them. Perfect. Um, all right. I think we have time for one more question. Um, do you have any advice on how often we should be doing medication reviews mm -hmm. in our outpatient practices. Like if we've identified patients that are on a certain number of medications, let's say, do you have any advice on how often we should be doing those reviews? Like, should we be doing it every time a prescription comes up for renewal? Should we be doing it more frequently? Any advice on that? Yeah, that's another hard question. Um, I mean, in long-term care, we've talked about quarterly medication reviews. Uh, is quarterly too often for primary care? I, I think, I'm not sure how manageable that would be, but I, I think it's probably reasonable to suggest annually past either a certain age or, uh, or a certain number of medications. And I know that's what's done in other countries is a, a requirement for at least an annual review. But I think looking at each time a new medication prescribed is, is not a bad idea either. Um, I'm just, you know, I would, I would want to review medications all the time because of who I am. But I know that that's not realistic in practice. So um, I, I guess the bottom line, I would say is, is probably at least annually after a certain age. Okay, that's great. Uh, there were some other questions. I do apologize to our members because we couldn't get to all of them. That's often what happens. Time is our worst enemy. Um, there's a couple of little housekeeping things I just want to do before uh, before we sign off. Okay, so, and I realize, Alan, I forgot your conflict of interest. Sorry. Oh no, that's okay. Uh, we listed it at the front, so um, so everybody got a chance to see it. So uh, so that's okay. Not a problem at all. Um, so we've reached the end of our time. I do want to thank you, Dr. Farrell, so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to speak with us today. I uh, just want to remind our members that to claim the main Pro Plus credits, please fill out the online survey which was posted in the chat on YouTube, um, hopefully more than once. And uh, you have until the end of day Friday in order to fill out that survey so you can get your main pro credit. I just wanna mention that we do have some upcoming webinars uh, to bring to your attention. And you can always go to the CFPC website or the CFPC Twitter handle uh, because we do advertise there. So on January the 12th, um, please mark the date, we have another COVID-19 uh, pivot webinar on, it's a, it's a vaccine update for family physicians. There's gonna be a panel of physicians from across Canada to, uh, to speak on that issue. We have an ID doc, we have a member of the NACI committee. We also have a family physician who does some research in this area. So that should be a great talk, January the 12th. On January the 19th, we have a talk called Anyone Care. Uh, that would be sort of like for the hemoglobin A1C about clinical outcomes. It's simplifying diabetes. And that's with Mike Allen and his colleague, uh, Tina Kay um, from Alberta. And then on February the 23rd, uh, we have primary care approach to common eye problems with Simon Moore and Christine Richardson. So please check out our website or our Twitter handle for more information on those. And just before we close out, I just wanna mention that since this will be the last webinar, of 2020. I want to wish everyone a happy and healthy holiday season. Please take some time to recharge as we head into 2021. With the recent Health Canada approval of the COVID-19 vaccine from Pfizer and more to follow, hopefully, uh, there's some light at the end of the tunnel regarding the pandemic. I just want to thank all of our healthcare provider colleagues for everything that you do, both as physicians and professionals. Thanks for joining us today and please enjoy the rest of your day.